I love it is because Esther is one of these women in the Bible who shows us how to do the, the God thing, as it were, as a girl. She shows us how to do the God thing as a girl. She shows us what true beauty is like, the kind of beauty that captures hearts and not loins. She shows us what authentic feminine strength looks like, strength that's exercised and used on behalf of others and not herself. And she's brave. She's courageous. She's a warrior woman who submitted to the plans and the purposes of God for her life and who left a lasting impact and a lasting legacy on the world around her. And of course, obviously, she's a woman with a crown. She's a woman with a crown, and I think her story and her crown can speak right into our situation today. So we want to remind you of three things that, that you might associate with this crown that you might remember when you look at it in the future. And the first is this. This crown is to remind you of your position before your God. This crown is to remind you of your position, that you stand before him as a precious daughter. We want to remind you of that again this morning, that you stand before your God as a precious daughter. There's this little verse in Esther chapter 2, 17, that says this, so he set a royal crown on her head. And the he here is uh, the king, King Xerxes, who was the most powerful uh, king in the world at the time. He was the emperor or the king of, of the greatest nation on earth. And he was often referred to as the king of all kings, the great king, the king of all nations. And you know how some, you know, men, how some of them just love to show off. They love to show off about their strength and their power and how big they are. Well, he clearly wanted to break all the records about the longest meal and put on a feast that lasted for six months to show off and flash about his, his splendor and his wealth and his power, probably till the food in the nation ran out. And it's this massively powerful king of kings who sets this crown on Esther's head. And it's a visible demonstration it didn't change anything in one sense, but it was a visible demonstration of her new position before him. In her case, obviously, as his wife. Isaiah 61 verse 3, which has been part of our sort of vision at Splendor for, you know, for 10 years, says this. It'll be familiar to many of us. This is Jesus speaking through the prophet. He has sent me to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. This is Jesus saying, he sent me to bestow a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Psalm, 130, uh, Psalm 103 verse 4 says this, He, God, redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. He crowns you. He has crowned you with his love and compassion. Ultimately, the king of kings, the great king, placed a crown on your head when you stood, not at the altar like Esther did, but at the cross and received the forgiveness of Jesus and the offer and the invitation to relationship with God as father. That's the place where he was saying, I want to be your father. Will you be my daughter? And in the moment you said yes, Jesus says he bestowed on you, he put on your head a crown of beauty. And it's this crown that identifies you. It's like a badge. It identifies you as a daughter, as his beloved daughter. Now, I'm not a great dog lover. I'm not one of those. I know I live in a nation of dog lovers. I know some of my friends absolutely love their dogs. I'm not one of those people that voted for Ashley and Pudsey to win Britain's Got Talent a couple of years ago. But Edward VII was a great dog lover when he lived, and he had a little dog called Caesar. It was, um, it was a little wire fox terrier, which, uh, and this little dog was so famous, he actually, if you Google it, he has his own Wikipedia entry, which I think is pretty impressive. And uh, he became a constant companion of King Edward VII, and King Edward VII loved him so much uh, that everybody knew it, and, and uh, when he was died and, and, and it came to the day of his funeral, actually this little terrier, Caesar, walked at the front of the funeral procession behind the coffin, 
And the dog was at the front and followed by nine other kings and various heads of state. So important was he. And this little dog, Caesar, he used to wear a collar that Edward VII had put on it, put on him. And this collar said, I am Caesar and I belong to the king. And this crown, this crown that we have put into your hands today, let it be to you a reminder that you belong to the king, that you belong to the great king. It's a beautiful symbol of your position that you stand before him, not as a servant, not as a slave, not as a nobody, not as some kind of afterthought, not as an orphan, not even as his soldier. You stand before him. Every time you come before him, you stand before him as his daughter, a chosen daughter. He chose you. He chose you to be his. We sometimes sing that song, don't we? I found Jesus. Do you know what? We didn't find Jesus. Jesus found you. And he chose you first and then came and found you. And here's the amazing thing. God chose us, God chose you to be his daughter before the creation of the world. Listen to these verses from Ephesians uh, Chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 from the New, Living Test- uh, the New Living Translation. Even before he made the world, God loved you and chose you in Christ to be holy and without finding fault in his eyes. He decided in advance to adopt you into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. So imagine that. Darkness is covering the earth. The spirit is hovering over the waters. There's no sun, there's no sea, there's no birds, there's no trees, there's no vegetation. And God is thinking, I want a Sarah. I want a Mary. I want a Kath. I want a Rosie. And it wasn't a kind of last minute dot com decision, like I might make a last minute dot com decision, you know. Oh, tomorrow evening, got a free evening, why don't we have some friends around? Let's invite some friends around for supper. God wasn't sitting there thinking and saying to Jesus, hey, Look, we've got some free seats in heaven. I know, her life looks a bit of a mess. Let's invite her to have one. This passage is saying that he chose us before the creation of the world. He chose you because he wanted you to be his daughter. It's mind-blowing. And I think God wants us to remember and to be reminded and to be grateful for this truth again today. He chose you first. Then he made everything else so that he could make humans, so that he could make you, so that he could have a relationship with you, so that he could love you. And I don't know about you, but I think sometimes the church acts and speaks a bit as if God needs us. You know, he needs your money, or he needs your service, or he needs you to be good, or he needs you to show up, or he needs, you know, dot, dot, dot. He needs you to be significant and change the world, and that's why he created you. But actually, this crown reminds us that the reason he created you was so he could have a relationship with you as his daughter. When Tim and I decided to have children, do you know what? We sort of, it wasn't a very difficult decision. We didn't sit there at home thinking, oh, do you know what? This house is quite hard to keep on top of. It'd be really useful to have some more members of the team <laughs> to clean up, do the chores, mow the lawn when they're older. They do that, it's great. But we didn't actually sit there thinking that. We didn't think, do you know what? Times are tough. Salary isn't great. I know, let's have a child. And then we can send them out to work and they can contribute to the family finances. We didn't sit there thinking, oh, do you know, it's really lonely, just the two of us. It'd be really nice to have someone else to love us. I know, let's have some kids. And then they can love us and make us feel better. We decided to have kids because we wanted some people to love which is why it's so painful, you know, when we we can't have children, because it's the thwarting of that desire that's made in God's image to love others, to love children. God created you so that he could love you. And this crown is a reminder of that choice, that you're his daughter, and he wants you to live and act and believe and stand and fight and do all that you do as his daughter. 
It's a symbol. Let it be a reminder every time you look at it as a, of his yes over you, of his I love you over you, of his I wanted you over you, of his I adore you over you, of his I died for you over you. Now, I know many of us, we, we know this in our heads. We know this in our heads, but I think the Lord wants to continually remind us of it because I don't know about you, but life is tough, isn't it? We live on a battlefield and we have the world and we have our flesh and we have the enemy telling us all kinds of other things. I need reminding over and over again because I find it so much easier to kind of look at the things that I'm not and the things that I've failed to do and to, to be conscious of my failures and the stuff that I, you know, think I must disappoint God. I need reminding over and over again that I'm his precious child, that I have a crown, and that he loves me as his daughter. And do you know, as the enemy attacks our kind of personhood and undermines who we are and distracts us from who we really are, do you know what? It affects our confidence. And as it affects our confidence, it affects our courage. And instead of pressing forward and reaching out for the more and, and, and stepping into what God has for us, so, easy, so often it's easier and the enemy wants us to shrink back and be less than all that he's made us for. Esther, she had a pretty shoddy past. She didn't have a brilliant CV. She was an orphan. She was an exile. She was a Jew living in Persia. She was uh, poor and she was a woman. But that didn't matter. The king couldn't care less. He chose her, and she ended up not being defined by any of that. She was defined by her position. And do you know what? The enemy wants to remind us of our poor performance. He wants to remind us of our past. He wants to remind us of the fact that we're not perfect. But that's not what matters to God. He sees us. We are defined by our position to him. Jesus, he paid for our past. He paid for our poor performance. He paid for the, the fact that we're not perfect. He paid once and he paid once and for all and now he's given us this crown. And he says, let this crown remind you who you are and how I see you. It's about your position. And he wants us to have the confidence to believe that every moment of every day we qualify. We qualify for his blessing. We qualify for his favor. We qualify to be used. We qualify to be filled. We qualify to expect him to provide for us as his children, as his girls. That we qualify for him to fight for us, to sing over us, to demonstrate and pour his love into us because of our position. And the thing about a position as daughters, which is different to any other kind of position, once you're a daughter, you're always a daughter. That position can never, ever change. And some of us, you know, find this easier and some of us find it harder to experience and to know and to believe and to stand in, stand on and trust the love of the Father. So let's be praying today. God, help me with this. I want to experience more of your love. I want to experience more of your revelation. I want to know you more intimately as father and I want to live as that daughter who's invited to come before you with boldness and confidence. It's a symbol of our position. Secondly, it's a symbol of power. It's a symbol of the power that God has given you. The moment Esther was crowned, she was given a whole pile of power and authority. Obviously, it wasn't hers. It belonged to her king. But he gave it to her, and we see her at various points in the story using it in particular, you know, putting on this incredibly lavish banquet for various members of the court. Of course, she couldn't ever have done that as a Jewish orphan girl. Power came with her crown. And it was tangible, visible resources for Esther. For us, it's spiritual power. It's spiritual authority. The power that we have been given in the form of the Holy Spirit in 2 Timothy 1, Paul reminds him, verse 7, that the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And he prays for the Ephesians that out of God's glorious riches, he would strengthen us with power through his spirit in our innermost beings. And this crown, we want this crown to serve as a reminder to you that you have the power and the presence of Jesus in you. It's a power that is 
in you. My daughter was, uh, you know, when she was little, she was, as I think many children do, you know, became quite concerned about where God lived, where Jesus lived. And we had this conversation. She was four sitting around the table eating her baked beans. And it was like, Mommy, where does God live? You know, we keep being told that God's here, God's there, God's everywhere. Where does God live? And uh, we talked a bit about that. And then I, then I said to her, but the most important place that God lives and loves to live is inside the human heart. And of course, as a curious little four-year-old, she was like, well, you know, how does he get into my heart? And I said, well, you know, we have to invite him. So she put down her knife and fork and closed her eyes and said, well, Jesus, I want you to come and live in my heart. And, you know, that was a life-transforming moment for her but I think sometimes we can forget how much is inside us what is inside us who is inside us because we have this great king the king of the universe the king who died the king who rose again inside us he's inside you and we want this crown to remind you that every moment of every day, wherever you find yourself, you have the power and the presence of God within you. We were, had the, the uh, privilege of going as a family to um, Malaysia last summer. And uh, on one particular occasion, the family wanted to go whitewater rafting. And uh, those of you who will know me well will know that uh, I'm not a whitewater rafter. I would rather sit in a coffee shop with a nice cake and a friend and have a good old chat rather than sail down a river uh, negotiating rapids. But for the sake of the family, I uh, consented and agreed to go along with the rest of them, the other five, and uh, do this day trip down this uh, river. And we were kitted out and uh, introduced to our guide who was going to kind of steer and navigate our boat who was a lovely Malaysian chap with a well-known Malaysian named Jeremy. (laughs) And so Jeremy got us into the boat and Jeremy showed us how to sit so that when we were going over the rapids, you know, we'd all be safe and everything would be okay. And it was, it was great. And we started off down this river and things began to get a little bit more choppy and a little bit more interesting. And uh, we got to this one bit and we went over one rock and it was all a bit shaky and wobbly, but it was okay. And then we went over another one. And before I knew it, I'd lost my footing and uh, I was moving quite rapidly out of the boat and suddenly I was underwater. And uh, the rest of the family, as you might imagine, were utterly horrified to watch what was going on in uh, one split second. But before I knew it, Jeremy had reached down, got hold of my life jacket collar, and hauled me back up into the boat, much to the relief of the rest of the family, you know, almost before I was kind of truly conscious of what was going on. It was a massively impressive rescue operation, as far as, as far as we were concerned. As far as Jeremy was concerned, it was kind of run of the mill. You know, the kind of the thing, kind of thing he does a lot of the time. And we praised the Lord for Jeremy being in the boat, and we were like, "Wow, isn't Jeremy incredible?" And I kind of felt the Lord saying through it, you know, as we were reflecting on it later on that day, "Yes, Jeremy was great, but he's got nothing on Jesus." You know, you, you were lucky that Jeremy was in the boat and Jeremy knew what to do. Jesus is in your heart. Jesus is in your heart. And every time you feel yourself slipping or falling or even going underwater or drowning, Jesus is inside you and he's got you. He's got you because wherever you are, he's with you, in you. He's got it covered. And he promises to be our comfort in our distress, the peace in our storm the lover of our souls in our loneliness, the hope that we need in our despair. He promises to be wisdom for us in our confusion. He promises to be power and strength for us in our weakness. And yet I think so often we can look outside and look for other sources of comfort maybe in other people, or in food, or in addictions, or whatever. We can go looking for hope in a different set of circumstances, you know, different medication, a different job, a different setup, a different relationship. We can hope for peace in a different set of circumstances. And all the time, he's wanting us to remember, I'm in you. Let me meet you in the place that you find yourself. Let me deal with your struggle in you. 
And the thing is, Jeremy couldn't have rescued me if I'd been struggling, apparently, he told me later. Because actually, when you're struggling, it's very, very difficult to be rescued out of the water. Lifesavers will tell you that. And actually, because it happened so quickly and I didn't know what was going on, I hadn't even got my bearings and hadn't formulated my plan about how I was going to get out of the water and not drown, I was easy for him to pull out. And actually, so often we end up struggling with what's on our, our plates and in our hands. And Jesus is saying, give in to me. Find me. Find my presence and my power within you. And I'll meet you there. And I'll do something with it. So let this crown be a reminder that you have the power of his Holy Spirit, his presence within you. And then lastly, it reminds us, let it remind you of your position, your power, and your purpose. This crown for Esther, you know, was symbolic of her purpose. God had a purpose for her, and God has designed you for a purpose. I know we're going to be hearing more about that later on today. But let this remind you, especially for those of you who've come here today, and you're thinking, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what God's doing. I can't see what's going on. I really don't know if I have a purpose or if he has a purpose for me. This crown is a reminder that God has a purpose for you and for your life. Now, obviously, most, Esther's most obvious purpose, if you know the story, was to save her people. You know, the deliverance of a nation was in the hands of a girl who'd been an orphan. You know, what was God thinking? A woman to save an entire nation. And it's easy, I think, to look at these stories in the Bible and think, oh, there's one purpose at one time, one event, on one occasion, one moment that we're all headed for. And actually, it's not quite like that. You know, God unravels our purpose as we walk with him rather than unveiling it in a great big sign, you know, at some point in our lives and then we're headed towards it. But this crown, let it be to you a reminder that God has a purpose for you and for your life. You know, Jesus talks about bearing fruit that will last Ephesians talks about good works that have been prepared for you to do. One of my favorite stories is about a water bearer in India who used to take a couple of pots uh, on his shoulders up this hill carrying water to his master's house. One of the pots was perfect, had no flaws in it. The other pot had a great big crack in it. And uh, every year, he would, uh, every day, he would take these pots up the hill on the end of his pole and deliver one and a half pots of water to this master's house. And then one day, uh, the, 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 the pot who was flawed began to complain and he began to apologize to the master. And he said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And uh, not to the master, sorry, to the, the chap who was walking up, the water bearer. And, and the water bearer said, what's the matter? And he said... Well, every day you carry this water load up, up to the master's house with you, but you only ever deliver one and a half pots of water because I never de deliver my full load. And the water bearer said to him, he felt sorry for him, and he said to him, next time I walk up the hill, have a look underneath you at the flowers alongside the path. And so they walked up the hill and the crack pot looked and he saw flowers alongside the path on his side. And he thought they were great. But then he began to be overwhelmed again with sorrow. And when he got up to the master's house, when they arrived, he felt bad again. And uh, so the water bearer said to him, well, didn't you notice that there were only flowers on your side? There weren't flowers on the other side. And the reason is because I knew that you had a crack in you. And so I took a packet of seeds and I planted those seeds along the path so that as we walked up day after day, your water would water those. And then I can pick flowers, and I have done every day for the last couple of years that the master has to grace his banqueting table. Without the way you are, that master wouldn't have such beauty in his house. Now, I love that story, and it's obvious to make the conclusion that, you know, God is great, and he uses our flaws, and he uses them for good, and he uses them to bless others, and that's all true. But I think even more significant than that is the notion that the crackpot fell into that somehow we have to be perfect in order to be used properly for the purpose that God has for us. He kept looking at the perfect pot and thinking, I need to be like that in order for, to fulfill the purpose that I'm designed for. He missed the point that actually God had an intended purpose for him as a cracked pot as he was. He could have taken some mud and smoothed over the crack and made sure he didn't spill any water, but that's how God wanted to use him, with his limitations, to water those flowers, to bring beauty into the master's house. 
And God has a purpose and a promise for your life wherever you are. He wants to use you and continue using you powerfully and significantly to bring beauty and to bring blessing into the lives of those around you. Let this crown remind you of that, that you don't need to become like anybody else. God wants to and will use you as you. Just be you with your gifts, your resources, your experiences, your passions, your limitations, your weaknesses. Because God's purpose requires you merely to be you. But believing and trusting in your position as his daughter and in his power within you. Whatever your present position, whether you feel like you're on the mountaintops, whether you feel like you're in the depths of the valley, or whether you're somewhere in between, you know, God has a purpose for you now, where you are, as that water leaks out, that water of his life and his power and his presence leaks out through the cracks within you to bring beauty and kingdom life to those around you. This little crown that we've put into your hands today, do you know what? It may not have much earthly value. If you go home today and you decide to put it on eBay tonight, you're not going to get very much for it. But we want to give it to you with our love, that it might be a reminder to you of the priceless crown that God has placed upon your head, that he placed upon your head when you chose to become his, that you belong to him. And we want this crown to be a reminder to you each time that you look at it. I don't know where you want to put it, whether you want to hang it on a mirror or put it in your Bible or put it somewhere else. Let it be a reminder to you of your position as his precious daughter, of the power that is in you through the life and the presence of Jesus and the purpose that he has for you to bring blessing and life to those around you.